National Science Week, everyone, and welcome to Actually, It's Phytoplankton, the podcast series about ocean ecology and NASA's PACE mission. I'm Jamie Cool, And I'm Lachlan McKenna, and we're from GoToQ Remote Sensing. Over the next six episodes, we will be bringing you a new way to learn about your oceans. We'll be speaking to scientists who work on NASA's PACE mission and sharing some science activities that you can do at home. But first, a little bit about us. We own a remote sensing company called GoToQ, which means what? Which means we study the oceans from space using satellites. Well, Lachlan does because he's an oceanographer. I'm actually a drama teacher. And you know what, Lachlan? It strikes me that I actually don't know that much about ocean ecology or remote sensing or NASA's PACE mission, even though I own a science company with you. So to our audience, you will be learning along with me over the course of this podcast series. So Lachlan. What is NASA's PACE mission? Well, I'm sure you've heard of NASA's mission to Mars and the Mars rover, right? Yes. And you've probably heard of the Cassini mission, which went out and explored Saturn. Oh, yes. I've heard of Cassini. That was cool. Well, PACE is a NASA mission that will explore the Earth, and it's a satellite that uses a technique called remote sensing. Also known as looking at stuff from far away. Correct. NASA will use PACE to better understand the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. The name PACE... P-A-C-E, stands for Plankton, Aerosol, Cloud, and Ocean Ecosystem. Cool. Okay, so we're going to be talking a lot about PACE during this podcast, and there is a lot to learn. But Lachlan, I'm going to start today with a question that I will ask all of our guests. What did you want to be when you were 13? Well, when I was very small, I wanted to study insects and bugs. But then later in high school, I thought, I'll join the Navy as an oceanographer. And uh, unfortunately for me, my eyesight is really bad and not good enough for the military. So instead, I went to university and studied oceanography there. And now my area of expertise is understanding how light interacts with materials present in seawater. And that includes phytoplankton. Okay, sounds interesting. Looking forward to hearing more. Um, But let's get back to our first episode. Whale poop, oil slick. Actually, it's phytoplankton. Today's episode is inspired by conversations we sometimes overhear down at our local beach. Sometimes when you go to the beach, especially if you have a high vantage point like at the top of a cliff, you might see big slicks of brownish red coloured stuff out past the breakers floating on top of the water. Uh Uh-huh, and I've seen them when I've been up in the Great Barrier Reef on research vessels. Right. And before I met you, I always thought these were disgusting oil slicks left by container ships. And I also recall being told at some stage that it was whale poo. Uh, Yeah, gross. (laughs) Yeah, that's actually what we hear down at the beach sometimes. People asking each other, what is that? Is it whale poo? Is it an oil slick? But you've got news for them, don't you, Lachlan? You slap them with some knowledge right there on the beach. Well, I usually just mutter quietly out of earshot. But yes, I have knowledge. Actually, it's phytoplankton blooming. Oh, okay. And you know this because? Because I studied those phytoplankton, which are called trichodesmium, during my PhD at James Cook University, and I've worked as an ocean colour scientist ever since. Yes, Lachlan has dragged me all around the place, from Townsville to Perth, even to America, where he worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Centre Ocean Ecology Laboratory, all to study something that looks like it could be whale poo. Which leads us to our first segment. Phytoplankton. What What the the heck heck is is it? For this segment, open up the resource pack for episode one at gotocurious.com. So phytoplankton are microscopic organisms that live in the ocean. They are algae, and scientists refer to them as autotrophs, which is a technical way to say that they make their own food using sunlight, carbon dioxide, gas, and other nutrients found in seawater. They are so small that you can only see them with a microscope. They are tiny, but very important. There are many different types and each have a different function in the ocean ecosystem. And we'll talk more about that in our next segment. All phytoplankton are food. They are at the very bottom of the food web. Phytoplankton are food for about anything that is bigger than them, including us. The seafood that we eat have at some stage eaten phytoplankton or eaten something else that ate phytoplankton. Yay! I'm full of phytoplankton energy. And not just from my fish and chips. Phytoplankton are also responsible for the air that we breathe. Yes, phytoplankton do the same job as trees in the rainforest. When making their own food, they convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. 
<laughs> also known as cow farts. No, that's methane. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. I told you I'm not a scientist. Carbon dioxide is what we breathe out. Our bodies, when making energy, convert oxygen to carbon dioxide. And phytoplankton convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. Ah, they bring balance to the force, Star Wars reference. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Can I ask you a question, please? Sure. If phytoplankton are microscopic, Lachlan, how come you can see them from space? Hmm, that's quite a question. Ta. I think it's best I get my colleagues at NASA Pace to take that on. NASA are currently working on sending up a new satellite to look at the ocean called Pace, which I mentioned before. And I've been working on aspects of Pace for several years. They love an acronym at NASA, don't they? Yeah, they do. NASA say this in their educational resources. Perhaps I'll read it in a smart-sounding voice if I can. Go ahead. If the oceans were empty of life, it would be blue. Sunlight is made up of a rainbow of colours, and when it enters the ocean, water strongly absorbs red light and scatters blue light. The result? A big, empty, blue-looking sea. Thankfully, our ocean is full of life and colour. Like water, phytoplankton absorb and scatter sunlight too. So the ocean's colour depends on the type of phytoplankton suspended in the seawater. Ah, now back to me and my own voice. So phytoplankton bloom in huge amounts. And from up in space, what we see are huge swirling patterns of greens and reds. So phytoplankton can make the ocean look like a marble from above. Now, if you were up on the International Space Station, you'd be able to see this with your own eyes. But to monitor them every day, scientists use satellites that orbit the Earth. Now, we can be pretty precise with how much phytoplankton there is, what we call biomass. But PACE, PACE will be really good at helping us know what types are there. Okay, that sounds cool. Um, It sounds to me like if we eat food and Mm -hmm. we breathe air, Mm -hmm. we should thank phytoplankton. Yes, we should. But it's not all good. Some phytoplankton blooms can be harmful. Now, that's the reason we need to study them so we can monitor the health of our oceans all around the world. Speaking of round, time for our next segment. Wheel of I've invited Dr. Ivana Setanich to join us to play this game. Ivana's work is featured on episode four, but you'll hear from her regularly throughout this series. Ivana is a highly accomplished biological oceanographer who works on PACE from Goddard Space Flight Center. And she was my office buddy at Goddard. Hi, Ivana. Hi. Hi, guys. For this segment, open up the resource pack for episode one at go to curious.com and find the ocean color wheel. All right, Lachlan and Ivana, it's time to play Wheel of Plankton. I've got in front of me a NASA resource called Ocean Color Wheel. It's two discs, and when I spin the top one, different phytoplankton appear in the window, and an arrow points to the color the ocean would be if that phytoplankton were suspended in it. Yeah, I picked this up last time I went to Goddard Space Flight Center. You can print and make your own ocean colour wheel at home. You'll need some thick white card, a round head fastener, or paper clip, and some scissors. If you want to play along, pause now and make your ocean colour wheel. Okay, so there are 11 different types of phytoplankton on the wheel, and you can explore them all in the resource pack. But for today, I'm going to spin the wheel and let Lockie and Ivana talk about the ones that we land on. All right, uh, Ivana's going first. Are you ready? Um, I was born ready. Okay, you get 30 seconds, and we're going to buzz you when the 30 seconds is up, so you've got to give us as much information as you can in 30 seconds. Okay, go. Okay, here we go. Spin, 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 stop. It's a sausage, Cinecoccus. Three, Three, two, two, one, go. go. Okay, so Cinecococcus is cyanobacteria, which means it's a bacteria that's pretending to be a plant, which means they can do the same thing as algae, which is actually kind of an algae. So it converts um, inorganic carbon into the organic carbon. It's ubiquitous, ubiquitous to all oceans, which means like it's present everywhere. Really likes kind of warmer waters, but you can find it everywhere except I think Antarctica. Ah, um, it has additional pigment. It's really, really teeny, teeny, tiny. And we discovered it 40 years ago. So this year we're celebrating 40 years of knowledge about Sinecococcus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm awesome. 
Good work. Okay, cool. Let's do it again. Uh, spin, 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 spin. Looks like a depressed sun. Marionecta Rubra. Three, two, two one, go. go. Okay, so Marionecta Rubra is actually kind of an animal that we consider to be a phytoplankton because it goes around and snatches the plastids, little teeny tiny organelles that contain chlorophyll. So it actually can do the same thing as algae. It snatches these organelles and then kind of floats around. It's really happy. It can eat stuff. It can also produce carbon. So it forms really dense blooms that are very, very red, hence the name Arenecta rubra. Rubra means like red in Latin. But the cool stuff about it is that he got also gets snatched by somebody else of those plastids. And then maybe I'm going to tell you about it later. So that's it. Awesome. <laughs> Good work. All right, let's do another. Spin, 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 spin. Looks like a Death Star, Emiliana Huxleyi. Three, two, one, go. So Emiliana Huxleyi is a type of colithophore, which is pretty cool because it's an algae that has, in a sense, an outside male calcium carbonate, so chalk. So when it blooms, we can even see it from the uh, from the satellites. It's turquoise water, but it's really, 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 really important for the carbon cycle because when it dies, it takes with itself this organic carbon, the photosynthesizer, but also this inorganic Ten. carbon. And what is really famous off uh, is the white cliffs of Dover. They're white because of organisms such as uh, Melania hoxia. They have calcium carbonate or chalk in them. Huh? Time's up. So, Ivana, mm-hmm. the cliffs, the white cliffs of Dover, you, you mentioned in there, can you elaborate a little bit more on how the chalky white cliffs of Dover are related to Emiliana Huxley? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's only so much as you can say in half an, half a minute. Um, so um, long, 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 long time ago in some other geological times, um, oceans had um, probably larger concentrations of these um, coccolithophores. And when they die, what happens in the oceans of the day when they die, they take this organic carbon that they photosynthesize and inorganic carbon they have on the outside, that this hubcaps, um, this chalk down with them and they sink down in the deep of the ocean. So if you have a large accumulation of these, so if they've been sinking over centuries and, and thousands of millennia, they're going to start making this accumulation, this layer of this white stuff, you know? And uh, due to the tectonics, these layers of white stuff or chalk is going to start kind of coming up. And that's what happened with the, um, with the closer dough. Or- All right, time for another Spin, 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 spin. Hairy caterpillar. Chaetoceros dibulus. Three, two, one, go. go. So Hitoceros dibulus, as people usually <laughs> call it, except for Jamie, it's a type of diatom. And diatom specific because they have the outside shell made out of glass. So these are the little algae that live in a kind of glass house, which is pretty cool. So hitosters falls in a big group of these diatoms, and they're really, really important for carbon export. They're the first bloomers during the springtime. Um, but hydrosaurus itself, hydrosaurus ability itself is abundant everywhere in the ocean sometimes can be toxic because kind of kind of goes in the gills of the of the fish and starts killing them by their gills for different weakness. That's the end. <laughs> Sorry, Ivana. Tell us how they kill the fish. I think, I mean, I'm not a specialist on the fish kills, but um, as far as I know, I think these hitosaurs kind of get entangled. Um, if there's big blooms or these hitosaurus abilities, they, they can accumulate in the fish gills. And that produces the mucus, or maybe the hatosaurus produces the mucus. I think it's some kind of um, some kind of collaboration there in production, and that kind of pretty much obstructs fish from um, using the gills in the ways that they should, so to um, kind of take the oxygen from the water, and then they die. Doesn't sound good. <laughs> you want to get There's a bunch of, but but the thing is, like, it's really important to remember that the hatosaurus is are really really important when it comes to the carbon export. They're the they're the first ones to bloom in the springtime. They're kind of like you know. The, the the bringers of the spring or whatever the English word is. Um, they're like, when you see them, it's like springtime in ocean. Oh, they're the daffodils of the sea. Mm. Daffodils of the sea. They can be the crocuses, daffodils, tulips, early tulips of the sea. Yeah. It's good to know that the ones, even the ones that are a bit toxic also have an important function and we don't just want to get rid of them. I mean, everything has a function, but just we think about these things from the perspective, really selfish perspective of the humanity. So if we are somewhere away, there would be like, you know, okay, some, some birds, probably some, some fish would die too. No, not so much fish. I think the mammals and birds would die because of these things, but it's just part of the ecosystem. Okay. Let's do another. Ready with the clock, Lachlan? I'm ready. Okay. Time to spin. Spin, 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 spin. Stop. Cow heart with a tail. Alexandrium. Three. Two, one, 
Go! So Alexandrium uh, is a group of dinoflagellates. Um, dinoflagellates are different than diatoms and everything that I mentioned before. So dinoflagellates kind of build out of cellulose. They have two teeny tiny flagella that kind of make, make, allows them to move. Um, this species, this group, is actually really famous for the fact that, I mean, it's present everywhere, but mostly in coastal ocean. And what it's famous about is that it can be toxic. Okay. It can be really, really toxic. Um, and I think it causes toxicity also in uh, Australia, and it can be accumulated through the shellfish and cold paralysis. That's it. Ooh, I'm going to do a Nicole Byers. <laughs> yeah, done. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So a uh, dinoflagellate you mentioned has little swimmy things. Swimmy things. So can they, can, can they move around, and can other phytoplankton, do they just float? So the word phytoplankton comes partially. So the second part of the word comes from the word plankton, which means wanderer. Um, in a general sense, these are the things that are wandering around the ocean pushed by the currents. Adenoflagellates can swim. I mean, all of them can move a teeny tiny bit. None of them can swim against really strong currents. But of all of them, adenoflagellates are the strongest swimmers. They have these two flagella. And one of them kind of like moves as a course crew in front of them. And kind of the body follows it. Um, and um, they're sometimes going to move up and down in a water column. There's certain types that you can, you know, because they're fluorescent, you can actually see the movement. Um, so, yeah, these guys can move a little bit, but these are not like, you know, successful swimmers like tuna fish. They're still going to be carried around uh, with the currents of the ocean, hence the planktus. Here's another. Another? Another. Okay, let's go. Spin, 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 stop. Pile of sticks. Lachlan, I think you've got to take this one. Trichodesmium. Three, two, one, go! go! Me! Okay, so trichodesmium is a cyanobacteria, and they form thread-like structures, and when they cluster together, they look like a pile of sticks or pom-poms. They are brown, and they f- often float on the surface and can, when they break down, be very, very smelly. They're really important in... Waters where there's not much nutrients because they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and bring it into the ecosystem, and then that gets cycled through to other things. That was amazing, Lachlan. That was amazing. Pressure. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we got one more. Time for one more. I would just say Okay. this circles back to the title of our segment, or a title of this podcast, which is... Whale poop, oil slick. Actually, it's phytoplankton. Yes, because the discussions that we hear about brown, stinky, floating stuff at the beaches here in southeast Queensland, in October, November, typically that is trichodesmium that we see. So there we go. Yeah, so if you're thinking, is it whale poop, is it oil slick, not only can you say, actually, it's phytoplankton, you can say, actually, it's probably trichodesmium. Depending on where you are. (laughs) And it's not toxic. Oh, yes, not toxic. Just to say. So you can go for a surf. They're smelly, but they're the good guys. I mean, peanuts peanuts of the ocean, legumes (laughs) of the sea. Oh, right, might have gone too far. (laughs) Okay, let's try it. (laughs) Too much banter. Chicken of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> They're brown, aren't brown. they? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have time for one more. Here we okay. go. Spin, 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 spin. Oh, I know something about this one. I know it causes diarrhea. Dinophysis. Three, two, two one, one, go. go. So dinophysis is another phyto- phytoplankton dinoflagellate. Um, see, dino, diarrhea, doesn't rhyme. But these two guys very often cause to- produce toxins that can cause diarrhea. So they're present in all the world's ocean. Uh, they're very successful swimmers. And similar to that marionecta rubra that I mentioned before, they snatch the plastic. They actually snatch it from marionecta who snatches it from another algae. So this is like the and- third order. Ah, Stealing. So anyways, they cause diarrhea if you eat shellfish that has eaten them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good work, everybody. Good work. Okay, that's the end of Wheel of Plankton. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Lachlan, for playing along. That was a lot of fun. Always. Oh, no. Hey, Ivana, before you go, sure. I need to ask you a really important question. Okay, go ahead. Star Wars or Star Trek? Uh, both. Both? 
I'm sorry. I'm like a side lady. <laughs> okay, so I love Star Star Wars. I really adore Star Wars, but then on the other side, Star Trek Next Generation and everything just stemmed from that. I'm just like a gigantic fan. I can I can live in two universes. I can live in a million universes. I'm ready for everything. So yeah. Awesome. I can Lachlan wants to also answer the question. Star Wars or Star Trek Lockie? Star Wars, because Chewie is like a walking trichodesmium colony. <laughs> That's not why yeah, I like Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> I am also into Star Wars. I don't like Star Trek really at all. Lockie likes both too. All right, folks, that was fun. Thanks to Ivana for joining us. And you can continue to explore the phytoplankton wheel using the episode one resource pack at gotocurious.com. Now it's time to be Go to Curious at home. With every episode, we will add an at-home activity that you can do with your family or share with your students if you're a teacher. Today we have plankton playing cards. You can play Snap, Go Fish, Celebrity Heads, or 20 Questions, or just use them as study flashcards. You can print the cards and the game instructions from gotocurious.com. Let us know how you went by sharing a photo or video with us on Facebook. Well, that brings us to the end of our first episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please like Go to Curious on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Go to Curious. Every week, we give away two fantastic science prize packs. The details of this week's competition are on our Facebook. If you're listening during the week of August 15, 2020 and live in Australia, then you can enter the draw. Our science prize packs are designed especially for middle school students. That's anyone in grades 7, 8 or 9. The prize packs come in a custom-made, actually it's phytoplankton tote bag, and are packed with science activities, merchandise, posters and even a microscope and slide making kit by Foldscope. Head over to the Go to Curious Facebook page to look at the full contents of our prize packs and discover how to enter the draw. Next episode, we bring out the big guns. I interview Dr. Jeremy Wardell, the PACE project scientist, and Dr. Paula Bontempi, Acting Deputy Director, Earth Sciences Division, NASA. See you next week. Actually, It's Phytoplankton is a Go to Curious production proudly supported by an advanced Queensland Engaging Science grant provided by the Queensland Government. Thank you to NASA Goddard Space Flight Centre Ocean Ecology Laboratory for collaborating with us, providing in-kind support and credited use of education and outreach resources. Special thanks to Ivana Sertinich and Lachlan McKinna who work with me behind the scenes in the writing and preparation of the series. Our theme song and all podcast music is composed by me, Jamie Cool. I also edit the series and create the supporting materials on our website, gotocurious.com, in collaboration with Ivana and Lachlan. Logos, website, and social banners designed by Boone Creative. Our custom podcast t-shirts and totes are made especially for kids by Zay and B Designs. <laughs>